John Hickenlooper recently spent six months running for president of the United States of America. He served two terms as mayor of Denver, followed by two terms as governor of Colorado. He's a craft brewer, an occasional banjo player, and is currently running for U.S. Senate in Colorado. Thanks for being here. No, what a treat. So I, I made a joke to start that as we were testing the volume of the microphones, you even did that in a way that was charming and funny. So. <laughs> well, I was trying to imitate, you know, call uh, uh, when Peyton Manning was a quarterback of the Broncos, he would, one of his big calls was, was Omaha, Omaha. And I wanted him to say rodeo, rodeo, because I thought it was more Western now that he was in Colorado. Um, so I practiced many variations of it. It's a good way of doing a sound check. Yeah, I think so. So I wanted to just kind of uh, start with the here and now. And you sent me a text a couple of minutes ago saying that you had just finished your lunch and that it was with Madeline Albright. And, you know, could you come over? So um, I had the pleasure of meeting her once and introducing her actually to Lawrence Wiener. And um, Lawrence Wiener, of course, is an amazing American conceptual artist, and they're about of the same vintage. And um, and I think they, you know, he noticed her in the restaurant. We were in Aspen, and he said, that's Madeline Albright, and I really want to meet her. And so I went over and I said, hey, I'm having dinner with, <laughs> or actually lunch, it was lunch then, uh, you know, with an American legend. And, you know, will you come over and and say hello when you're done. So she came over and then actually that night we ran into her again because that's the way Aspen is. Um, but you know, he, it was very cute because they seemed like they sort of, you know, had mutual admiration and, and maybe even a crush, you know? Um, and um, so curious what you guys talked about at lunch today. Oh, we talked about politics. We talked about international affairs. Everyone always, you know, Aspen has this patina that it's a playground for the super rich, which to a certain extent is true. But underneath that are, you know, people that are really passionate about international affairs. You know, the Aspen Institute brings in some of the greatest minds that there are every summer and, and really all through the year. Uh, the art museum, as you know, is a world-class art museum. So there's this generally and genuinely and unbelievably rich kind of cultural and, and intellectual base here. And, you know, it's just to be able to spend 90 minutes with someone like Madeleine Albright and really her hear her take on what the world needs to do to adjust to the new nationalist uh, initiatives that are taking place literally on every continent and, and what are their response to and, and what does the future look like depending on one choice or another. It's just fascinating. So for someone like me, to be able to have several conversations within a day, uh, uh, it just provides real value. So, I mean, we're living in such challenging times, right? And, right. Yeah. Uh, and you've chosen now in this part of your life to um, be of service to the greater good. So what motivates that for you? What, you know, what, let's start there. Sure. And, you know, I was, my mother grew up in the Depression and she was widowed twice before she was 40. So for the first half of my life, I really was very focused on financial security and having enough money. And I would always have two or three jobs. And, and suddenly, as often happens, you know, for years, I mean, there were some rug, I was out of work for two years in the late 1980s. Uh, but Right at the end of the 1990s, suddenly all the restaurants and brew pubs that we'd started, and they were all in historic buildings, and, and over time we'd purchased the real estate, they all took off. And suddenly I was, I was 49 years old, and I had the opportunity to think, where, where, where do I derive joy? And I served on, this is weird, but I served on 42 nonprofit boards and committees in the 12 years before I ran for mayor of Denver. And I, when I ran for mayor of Denver in 2003, the, it was the decision that I was going to give back and that the people were so disgusted by government and so cynical about it and that I thought I could help make government better 
and get people to begin to see government as, you know, possibly actually a, a good thing that does provide essential services. Uh, and so we went off and, uh, you know, I ran for mayor. No one thought I could win. And I got two thirds of the vote and then ran for governor of Colorado after doing a lot of regional work as mayor and got, you know, won in a, not quite a landslide, but a large victory. I uh, was the first Denver mayor in 120 years to get elected governor of Colorado. And I just found that it was something I loved that, you know, the problem solving, bringing people together, figuring out solutions, but also the, you know, the, the, the opportunity to work with so many other people that are not worried about how much money they're going to make or their, you know, community organizers who've been trying to build affordable housing their whole lives in their community. And, and again, the richness of the relationships, it was something I could have never gotten if I just stayed in the restaurant business. So, you know, it's funny that the first half of my life really was about achieving financial security. And I think the second half of my life is going to be about, you know, trying to find those places where I can, you know, play a, a whatever size role in making things better. So I've been involved in the last, not quite year, but with the Stegen Institute in Dallas. And, and a big part of what um, they do there is to help people figure out what their value system is, right? Your North Star sure. and figuring out how to be in alignment with, with your mission. So you're talking about all of that and um, the age that you stated, you know, that's if people are fortunate and have had that kind of success, it's, it usually happens around then. Did you use a structured approach to, to figure that out or, or what, what was your strategy? You know, it's funny. I, I had never run for student council. I had never been involved in politics of any kind. At, 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 you know, by 1998 or 1999, I had... 14 restaurants that were all doing well uh, to varying degrees. Some were doing less well than others. Uh, but I, I got kind of swept up in this. Um, the, the, the metropolitan Denver area was building a new football stadium for the Denver Broncos. And the whole region had voted to use tax money to build this stadium. And the old stadium, Mile High Stadium, was beloved. Right? The Broncos had won two Super Bowls in the last six years. So people were really... They were happy to vote for it. They, they embraced the Broncos. And suddenly, you know, about nine months before the stadium was supposed to open or a year before, uh, they decided that they were going to sell the naming rights to a corporation to help, you know, help the stadium open uh, sooner. And people felt betrayed. And I kind of met a, a guy who was trying to organize people. And I sort of said, yeah, that... that that's not what the people want. You know, why is government not doing what the people want? So we got a few people around the bar to all chip in a few hundred bucks. And we uh, got a pollster who was doing a poll for somebody else to add on two or three questions to his poll and proved that 70% of the people in metropolitan Denver were happy to pay. It turned out to be $4.24 a year. I mean, just $4.24 a year. Uh, would be their savings from selling the naming rights. And they said, we'd all be happy to pay that in additional sales tax. Why are we selling it? Well, my gosh, I was on TV. I was on the front page of the newspaper. And, and then it went away. Until six months later, Mayor Webb, who was then the mayor, took it on and said, some things just shouldn't be for sale. And he really stepped in and used political skill that I'd never seen up close and personal before in, in how he was able to take the people's will and really make a strong statement. And in the end, we became the first city in America to create a compromise. It became Invesco Field at Mile High. And, and you know, I didn't think that, I didn't, I just was impressed. I thought that that's a, you know, interesting, that, you know, I didn't understand how that had ever worked before. And then within a couple of weeks after that compromise was announced, several people came up and said, Mayor Webb is gonna be term limited out in two years. Have you ever thought about running for mayor? Three different people, I mean, his communications director, uh, Chris Romer was a state senator. His father had been the governor. A guy, uh, another guy named uh, Chris Gates was the head of the National Civic League. Independently, they all came up and thought, I, this would be something I should consider. And so I, the, to the first two, I said, no way. Why would I do that? But the third, when Chris Gates came up, I said, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll do that. And I went around and visited mayors in other cities and other states. I visited suburban mayors to find out why they hated Denver so much and why did... 
Denver politicians hate the suburbs so much. And I just got kind of sucked into this seemed like something, A, that I might like, B, that, that I might be good at. And, and the thing I asked all these mayors is, can you make a difference, right? And, and to a person, the big city mayors, you know, I met with um, uh, uh, Menino, Mayor Menino was the mayor of Boston at that time. I met with uh, Steve Goldsmith, who'd been the mayor of Indianapolis. I met with Jerry Brown when he was the mayor of Oakland. And, and to a person, they all said, you know, you can make a difference. It is something you would probably be good at. And, and it's something that you'll, you know, the chief of staff who had been uh, chief of staff for uh, Mayor Rendell in Philadelphia and then had been chief of staff for Governor Rendell in Pennsylvania, um, but David Cohen, he said, one thing you will see is you'll meet people that you could never meet any other way. And that was part of it. That pushed me over the edge. It's so fascinating. And I mean, we're sitting here having a conversation, you know, in my house uh, as part of a new podcast. And it's very different. But for a long time, people were saying to me, like, you should do this. And I kept saying, like, no, why would I do that? <laughs> But then when enough people say something to you, people you respect and admire, then uh, hopefully we can all hear things that are counter to the way we initially perceived ourselves. Exactly. And, and especially when they're different people with different backgrounds, then you begin to say, what are they seeing that I don't see? And, and you try to pull yourself out of yourself, right? You know, take, try to see yourself as others from the outside see you, which is always a good exercise, right? It's a super good exercise. And um, honestly, it's something that I really struggled with and only kind of came to terms with in the last few years. And and some of it is the idea of um, being a female CEO and being a working mom and um, understanding the sort of unintentional role model um, that I became for people. And sometimes stepping into a role that you don't choose for yourself, but somehow other people seem to need you to fill. Well, and just as an observer, having you know interacted both as mayor and as governor with with the art museum and, and and Aspen, the skills that you developed in terms of dealing with the, the public, uh, the city politics, uh, the donors to raise money to build this amazing new museum that you that the community success you led the community to build this thing. Those skills are a lot of the same skills that you could have you would need to create a podcast that actually had heft and those skills include drawing people out and and having discussions that are meaningful uh, to larger numbers of people than just the two people at the table. Thank you. So we connected um, through our roles. Uh, but I think one of the things that we both really value is is art and culture. Um, and I know that you have a huge affinity for music. You play music. You're friends with musicians. Um, talk to me a little bit about how that matters to you. Sure. And that's just part of that was where, you know, I grew up in the 60s and, and music really, rock and roll was really exploding. And I don't know, I just, I went, I went to Woodstock. What can I say? Um, and... Music throughout my life has always been part of, I wouldn't say it's my North Star, but it's part of the constellation by which I navigate my life is art, uh, music, culture. And, you know, when I became mayor, the city of Denver owns Red Rocks. And it was this avenue, they, they, the city didn't pay much attention to it. And they, they were doing 32, 34 concerts a year. And I said, this is the most amazing outdoor performance venue on earth. And it's a brand of the city. If we want this Denver to transform itself and be a, a beacon for young people, millennials, you know, the, the young potential ent entrepreneurs will create the new economy, they're going to love music and, and bike trails. And, and, you know, we tried to think of all those things that young people would like. But, but music and art and, and drama, theater was a big part of that. And so we went and I, I asked the, the people that manage Red Rocks, uh, that worked for the city, worked for the mayor. And they said, well, if we do more concerts, the average attendance might go down and might diminish, diminish the experience because it's not so cool if it's only half full, which is true. But I said, how do you know that? People, you know, there'll be a Starbucks on one corner and Starbucks will open another store across the street and the, uh, the attendance in the original one goes up. 
from the from the just the the commerce. And so finally they agreed. It took me a year to persuade them. Uh, but leave it at, I mean, now they have 150 concerts instead of 32 in Red Rocks. And it's part of this, this brand that has allowed Denver to become a real magnet for, for young people from all different kinds of backgrounds. And I just thought that was part of what, what, what government, government's never going to create jobs itself per se, but government can be the catalyst and, and, and provide some of the infrastructure and the, the atmosphere, the environment that job creators are attracted to. And in that same way, you, you still need great schools. You, you, you absolutely need to have a, a healthcare system that, that takes care of people. Um, but, you know, having that kind of spiritual, more uh, emotionally visceral experience available to people, I think is a big part of what, why Denver has been so successful the last 15 years. Yeah. It, it's so interesting because you said to me at one point that one of the, um, not secrets to success, but one of the strategies that you used in your, in your brew clubs was, um, arranging the, the furniture in such a way that people bumped into each other. Oh, right. Right. And Friendly so, friction, we called it. Right. And so <laughs> not that they were uncomfortable, but there would be these kind of, you know, unintentional or unexpected interactions, right. And these sparks. Um, and, and I've thought so much about that and, and the way that you're describing that the kind of change of the, the energy really around Denver is, is maybe similar to that. Yeah. In a little way, it, it's a, it's, it's analogous for sure that you find ways that people come together in perhaps unexpected ways. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a certain excitement that almost everyone has when they meet someone that they feel is in some way a kindred spirit or they have certain shared values. Uh, and that kind of spark, that electricity is a big part of what, you know, makes people pick a place, right? Where do I want to live? Where do I want to raise my family? And if you have more of those kinds of encounters, I'm a big believer that's where you're going to want to be. And, and I honestly, you know, my, my six months when I was out running for president, I kind of tried to pitch that, that, that what we did in Denver and what we did in Colorado really is a beautiful model for, for Indiana and for Louisiana and for, you know, s states that have either through the Rust Belt or, or whatever, haven't done as well economically. It's all about attracting your young people to come back, or at least that's a big part of, of building an economic success. If all your young people keep going to San Francisco and New York and don't come back to raise their families, it's hard to have a strong economy. So we talked a lot about you running for president before you decided to run. <laughs> and I was a big advocate for, for that idea and, and for your ideas having a, a national and global um, stage. So what, what happened? <laughs> no, I know. No, that's not the question. Um, what What did you take away from the experience that um, was unexpected? And um, how are you using that moving forward now as you're running for Senate? Sure. And, and, and just to be absolutely clear, I loved running for president. Yeah. It was six months. It was a bucket list experience that I could have never had. And it was hard. You know, people in New Hampshire and Iowa, South Carolina... They had no idea who John Hickenlooper was. And I had to re-explain myself, reintroduce myself every day, five, six, seven times a day. And people would say, Hicken who? Hicken who? And that, you know, that's hard. That's hard work. And, you know, the what we're describing, these kind of ideas about how do you create a healthcare system that really controls inflation? How do you build an infrastructure that allows for growth? Uh successful growth, they're complicated to explain. And I, I wasn't, you know, if I had to do over again, I would spend a few more years preparing for it and build a national fundraising network and do a whole bunch more cable news appearances. So I got more comfortable with that. And, uh, you know, they're high, hindsight's 2020 and here, you know, I'm not sure when this will be, uh, 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 presented, but here we are on the, the last day of this decade, right? right. And, and what I like to say, just for the last few days, I came up with the idea that we can say that um, 
Hindsight is always 2020, but on this one day, we know that you don't need hindsight to have 2020 vision, <laughs> right? Because that's 2020 is right upon us. Um, and I think, you know, in the presidential campaigning, I learned what America really is, I think. And I, and I love, I think it's, a, you know, I, I couldn't get traction, as I tell my wife, Robin, I got 2%. You know, that's, that's pretty, it's something to, no one should be ashamed of, of having been in a presidential race and not having won. Uh, but I did this appreciation that the people of Iowa, they wanted to talk to all 24 candidates and they couldn't, they still haven't made up their mind, right? That's why it's so interesting. Uh, what, and I think that's why many people haven't dropped out yet mm. is because in Iowa, New Hampshire, North, South Carolina, Nevada, people take seriously their responsibility to help in the selection of the next president. And it's, it's a uniquely American process where people roam around a small interior state or a large interior state with a relatively small population. And, and people come to hear you. You go, you go to someone's home and 60 or 70 people come hear your ideas and ask you tough questions and the things that keep them awake at night. Again, this is uniquely American. And even as we feel, for, you know, depending on who you're talking to in America, dismayed about where we are in our, in our country's evolution and, and fearful about the future for, for a variety of reasons, we still have this unique form of, of governance that is fragile. It's relative to history is pretty young, a few hundred years, uh, but is in some way captivating and and I think resilient. So what, what I'm trying to take those lessons of, of, of what I learned about America and, 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 and what I already knew about Colorado, but put them into a campaign about what the U.S. Senate should be. And I couldn't get traction. Uh, people don't really care much about your record in this particular presidential cycle. But I think for, for the Senate, they will care about one's record. And I'm proud of what we've done in Colorado. And the nice thing is when I go, you know, campaigning around Colorado, people know me. I have a relationship. I was governor for eight years. Uh, strangers will come up to me in the supermarket and give me a hug and thank me for running. That didn't happen so often in Iowa. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think those lessons of really trying to hear where people are and what they're most concerned about and then present viable, cost-effective, you know, not expensive solutions. It, it's funny, when, when I'm out in Iowa and New Hampshire, and now when I'm out in, in, in Colorado, people didn't come up to me and demand to know whether I was for Medicare for All. They were much more concerned about the, the cost every year of their premiums, their health insurance premiums going up, and their copay going up, and their, their cost for prescription drugs going up. That was what was on their minds. And we, there are good answers for those, those questions, right? The same thing with climate change. People are terrified about what's happened, you know, all the rollback of the, of the environmental regulations. The EPA has been pretty much gutted. Uh, and people are concerned about that. And they want to know, how are we going to deal with climate change? And, you know, we, I've spent eight years working, or really more like 30 years working on, on solutions and practical solutions for, for climate change. It, now this is something where the Senate really could play a role. So what do you think about this notion of like American values? Do you think there are American values now coming into 2020? Well, I think that a lot of our, our country's value system was based on every person wants to take care of themselves and, and, and do well for their family. Mm -hmm. But historically, we've always had a strong sense that we would help our community. Mm -hmm. And that could be your neighborhood, could be your city, your state, or your country. And somehow in the last decade or two, that has been diluted. And the, the bonds, of the, you know, that, the, the, the net of, of shared responsibility has been frayed. And... You know, President Trump, I think, is a is not the cause, but I think he's a, a indication or a, you know an emblem of that self interest, where it's really what have you done to me, and if you've done something to me, I'm going to attack you, no matter what, no matter what you've done in the past, I'm going to attack you, and 
how can I benefit from this? Or how can my political party, how can we get more power? Rather than what is the best thing for the community. Now, obviously, that, that sounds like a democratic perspective. But I think the Republican side, you know, the more conservative side, has the same mistrust of Democrats and feels that we're doing going about things in completely the wrong way. And in both cases, there is a, 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 a set of values that have been lost in translation in some way. And I think that's a, uh, you know, a problem that, that we have to deal with because we do have values, right? Our, I think American values are about community. And you know, while we all work for ourselves and our family, we realize that by working together and in some, you know, in many cases, we take a smaller piece of the pie than maybe we could have fought for because we realize the pie is going to grow much bigger if we all collaborate in, in, in baking it. That we've lost that. And that's, that is the single reason that the United States became the country that, that it is, is we collaborate and work together better than anybody. And we've got to get back to that. So one of the reasons that I'm interested in, in all of this is because I really believe, not surprisingly, you know, in the power of, of art and culture. Um, and, you know, a value that I really hold is that I, I, I genuinely believe, and of course people do call me the eternal optimist, but <laughs> acknowledging that, you know, I really do believe we have more in common than, you know, we think we do. Um, and one of my strategies at the museum always was to use art to talk about things that couldn't be talked about in mm. um, ways that were comfortable otherwise. So, you know, going and talking with third graders um, in rural areas in, in Colorado about bias and diversity, but using works of art to have those conversations. And then going back five years later and talking to their parents um, after having already built that kind of trust. And um, so I, I guess it's a question about, do you, do you see a role for art and culture in that kind of re-stitching, uh, commonality amongst Americans, like amongst Coloradans? Um, I do. And, and it's, but it's not always as direct as people might think. I think most great music, great art is, is drenched in values and, and, and is saying something that connects with people in, in, in what they hold as important. And in that sense, it does bridge the divides again and again and again. And, you know, one of the ideas we've been tossing around, I think we're going to try and do it, but I do know a bunch of these musicians and, you know, the fact that I am such a poor musician myself just makes me love the good ones all the more. Uh, but, you know, the, the notion of a town hall meeting and having 30 or 40 minutes just to ask questions of a candidate and, and have an unvarnished, here's, here's a response, that that's attractive to people from all different parties. And I thought rather than just going out and talking to Democrats, you know, this summer we might go out and I'd get a musician friend, you know, uh, we're old friends with the guy who wrote Wagon Wheel, Rock Me Mama Like a Wagon Wheel. Good song. Yeah, great song. And... And he's an amazing musician. He has a band called Old Crow Medicine Show. Just a terrific, terrific group of musicians. But, you know, he's going to have some time off in the summer. And maybe he having come out for five days. And he's got two little kids. And we'll go to five or six small towns, you know, a few thousand, maybe 10,000 people. But, but even bigger places like Grand Junction. That's more like 100 or 120,000. But we'll get a theater. And we'll get a couple local musicians who we convince they want to come play with Catch who's kind of this big rock star. And, and then we'll get some local person to be the commentator and do a kind of a fireside chat for 25 minutes on stage, like a town hall meeting. But we'll, we'll blend music and politics and the community in one, you know, 90 minute, two hour event. Um, and I think it, I, it's kind of a goofy idea, but I think it's a different way to present politics. And the hope is, just as you were describing, that having music be a part of it and have a big star but also local musicians will allow people to make connections to the political ideas you know how do we solve some of our problems that they wouldn't otherwise make i love the idea i really do and the thing that well, I, i'll get you to come be the commentator on one <laughs> or two of these things you know what i was just thinking that i would be so honored to do that and what i love about it is um, I, I like backing into things you know, um, I like the, 
the opportunity to sort of unexpectedly create um, the chance for people to talk to each other. You know, I that's friendly friction. Friendly fiction, friendly friction, and and that's what I that's what I always loved about the museum. You know, is that um, I always said it was the one place in Aspen where you could come regardless of who you did or didn't vote for, or what you do or don't do on Sunday, um, and you know, rub shoulders with people that are probably not like you um, and have a shared experience, right? And and often it's an emotional experience. So music gets kind of inside of your soul, right? Maybe your foot starts tapping or you might inadvertently smile or, and then you might look across the room and see someone else doing that. Um, so this morning I was at yoga, which I often am. And one of the best things about it is the music that um, Aaron King plays. And they're people that I practice with. I don't know their names, but I know the guy who sings, you know, when a Led Zeppelin song comes on. And I know the woman that dances when there's, you know, a like hip hop song. And, and there's, there's a community, there's a sense of community that happens in that space. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, whether you're in yoga or whether you're going to a political event, uh, or really even, you know, I remember that, uh, when I was a kid, I ended up in Eugene, Oregon at a, at a organic food store. And they had a pool table raised up in the center of the store. So you go up a couple steps and around the sides were shelves below where you were, the steps that you were raised up on. So people could be shopping around you and they'd have a couple of musicians playing while you shopped. And I think that, you know, putting together culture in places where you're just doing the, the mundane, you know, going to purchase the food you're going to eat for the next week. There's something magical about that. I think so too. And particularly when people think it's not for them, right? Exactly. It's like, oh, art? No, that's not for me. Or, you know, contemporary music? Oh, that's not for me. Anytime you can convince someone that something that they thought wasn't for them was for them, then it opens up all these other possibilities for all these other things that could potentially be for them also. It's yeah. super transformative. Yeah. And, and, and that can even go to appreciating a different style of art or music than what you've believe before um you know just in the last week or so i've had i ended up at a um uh there's a, a, a artist named nora and pure and she's a, a, a electronic dance music edm rising star and she's i think she's half half uh swedish no half swiss and half south, south african but anyway you know i've been to a number of concerts of, of edf I find it monotonous, wasn't very captivated. She somehow opened a window where suddenly I, I, I got it. And it, 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 it kind of filled me up a little bit that, that um, here, was, here was somebody, a whole form of music that I hadn't really appreciated. And, and, and then suddenly it's, it's, I, I connected with all these strange people that were liking something that I didn't understand. And it, you know, it does break down a barrier. Yeah. I mean, anytime something that seems um, distancing or unavailable becomes available, it is, um, it is magical. And I sometimes tell the story, um, Richard Betts is a friend of mine and um, you probably know yeah, him I too. I know Richard, he's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, youngest master sommelier ever and um, just super down to earth. And um, I never was interested in wine. I'm, you know, still not a connoisseur or anything, but I'll never forget being at dinner um, at his house. He cooked and, you know, he poured me some wine. I said, oh, I don't really know that much about wine or I'm not that interested. And he said, well, you know, just take this and, and you know, give it a smell. And it kind of smells like old gym socks, doesn't it? I was like, what? You can talk <laughs> about art like, I mean, you can talk about wine like that? And then that became... Um, kind of a guidepost for me to talk about art too, you know, in ways that... Old gym socks? <laughs> well, just something familiar and unexpected, right? So mm -hmm. other common experiences of something that seemed kind of foreign and or distancing and, and not for you and making it, you know, mundane or available. Yeah. I mean, that unexpected and freshness, right? Which is, which is really kind of at the essence of what is, what, how we define unexpected. It's got a you know, when I was a student in college, I taught I was an English major as an undergraduate. I get, went back and got a master's in geology, earth and environmental science. But when I was taking creative writing and, and, and English, there was a, a professor named Paul Horgan. 
He came in one time and wrote on the board um, this expression, which I've always loved. He said, and they said it to us. He said, everything has been said, but not everything has been said superbly. And even if it had, everything must be said freshly again and again. And that kind of defines freshness. No matter how well someone's already said it, it's got to be said freshly. It's, it's got to be that unexpected that, that comes out and because that's what cuts through all your daydreams and whatever else you're thinking about. And suddenly it's new, it's unexpected and it's relevant. And, and all of a sudden you're connected. So I'm curious, one of the things you've talked about is um, you have the face blindness challenge, right? Uh, um, and Prosopagnesia. Right. Um, so... So there are additional challenges potentially in connecting with people who, you know, you may have met before or, or whatever, but do you have a, a sort of, I mean, obviously I find you super engaging and it's clear, you know, in the conversation that you are, um, but in terms of making those connections, do you, do you have, do you have a go-to or, or um, is there uh, a question when, you know, someone's particularly tough to um, get to warm up to you or um, are, are there sure. yeah, defaults or well, the, how the, do you do it? The face blindness, which most people don't realize is a medical condition. It's a spectrum that everybody's on. And, and, and some people are really, really good at recognizing a face. They can walk into a room of 30 people, walk around, see all the people. And then the next day you show them 80 people and they'll pick out the 30 people that were there. And, and they are 100%. People like me, uh, I could talk to someone for an hour at night and see them the next morning at Starbucks out of context and I wouldn't recognize them. I just don't, my mind doesn't, even when I'm really focusing on, uh, on facial characteristics, they don't go into my mind that I can easily ac access them. So it is, it does create, but it just makes you be a little more friendly. If someone looks right. like they really know me, I try to act like I know them. <laughs> and you know, sometimes you end up being a little too friendly to strangers. <laughs> Um, but that's not a bad way to be in life. I agree. Um, and, you know, you, you do end up having to develop certain, like, depending on how, if someone's angry. Right. Um, and this is partly learning from the restaurant experience. You repeat back to them their exact same words. And, and they feel validated hearing what they're saying coming from someone else, the exact same words. And they calm down. It is, again, talk about magical. Mm. It, is, it is transformational. Um, I've also, you know, people that aren't angry, you're just meeting people, but they somehow have a little barrier. You don't feel like you can, because I need to have that interaction or else I won't remember them because I'm face blind. But, and it's just, this is, goes back to when we were children, just ask about themselves, right? That is always to try to get into what they're thinking about, what are they preoccupied with. It's almost always interesting. I mean, other people just are, inherently interesting once you get past the veneer uh and you know once you get having the discussion uh then you're off and running and who knows where where the discussion goes so great when you were governor there were some really um terrible things that happened and without talking about kind of the reasons why but just talking about the sort of eq that you brought to it um I just remember being very struck with um, how you managed the um, conversation after the the movie theater shooting, um, and and I just want to ask about the skills that that you brought to that, and how you keep yourself sort of centered and grounded in the face of incredibly painful experiences. Yeah, that my first four years as governor were, I mean, just the shooting in the the movie theater, um, a couple other school shootings, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. I went to too many funerals. Too many good kids died in those 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 wars, and the worst floods, the worst uh, the worst wildfires we'd ever had. And in a funny way. I almost felt like I'd been prepared just because, you know, my mother, my mother grew up in the Depression, never had money, learned, she sewed all her own clothes her whole life. And she was, she just had a hard, 
a tough run. Uh, her first husband died. She had two kids, and he died right on the day he was supposed to be discharged after victory in Europe during World War II. He had a freak accident. He was a pilot, and a freak accident crashed. Uh, she lost him, and then she married my dad, had two more kids, and then he got cancer. And but, So she was widowed twice before she was 40 and had to raise four kids by herself on very limited means, and she never complained. She said, you cannot control what life throws at you but you can control whether it makes you better or worse. And in a funny way, as I went from funeral service, again, 34 funeral services in that four year period, I went from funeral service to funeral service and spent a huge amount of time with, you know, the survivors of, of those lost lives. Uh, I learned, and it's funny, I, would, I had been trained, but I learned how to shut up and really listen and really pay attention. And along the way, I got, well, after the, the, the shooting in Aurora, President Obama came out and he'd been out four weeks before for the wildfire down in Waldo Canyon outside Colorado, Sp outside Colorado Springs where a number of people, number of lives were lost. So I spent time with him there and then he came out for the movie theater shooting. And we spent two hours consoling um, the families and, and, and the immediate families of, of, the, of, of the fatalities uh, who were there. And President Obama knew exactly, there'd be a group of eight people standing, waiting. They were all in clusters in this big, kind of a, like a gymnasium almost. And there was a meeting room in the hospital. Uh, but he would see, in one case, there was the mother and she had two sisters there. They all looked very much alike. Of, uh, and they'd lost their son, she'd lost her son. And then there were a couple of other kids and a couple of nephews. But President Obama, I watched, right, it was right at the very beginning, and he went up and he sat, he just went up there and didn't say anything. And there was this long moment where he just let the moment be. And then I could not see any acknowledgement on the faces of any of the other people, except he knew exactly which one was the mother. And he took one step, and, and leaned towards her and there was a pause and then her arms came up. So she began the embrace and they hugged. And it was amazingly powerful that, that what he was doing was listening and paying attention and really trying to be with them in their turf, on their, in their, you know, in their loss. Um, and that's, it's, you know, it's, I asked him about it afterwards and he said that, you know, part of the job of being president is your consoler in chief. And, and I looked kind of like, how am I ever going to do that? And he says, you know, it's not, it's not something you're born with. It's a skill you learn. If you're, if you're willing to put in the time and pay attention, you can be really good at it. And, and, and it makes an unbelievable difference into people, in the lives of people that are going through the worst experience that they could have ever imagined. Hmm. So interesting, that idea of being able to hold the space silently. It is. It's, in, in a funny way, it is connected to culture. And, and me, you know, I'm an extrovert. But, well, you may have noticed. I'm an optimist <laughs> and an extrovert. And I want to fill every space asking questions or, or telling stories or, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, the space around the image in a piece of art, that negative space, they call it. Um, and I had to be taught to appreciate that. But silence is the same way. It's kind of the negative space in, in, in our lives. And, you know, when you're consoling people or even dealing with loss yourself, um, being able to listen uh, and really hear and be with people that are going through tough, tough experiences or when you're going through a tough experience. You know, when I, I got laid off as my, you know, I was a geologist. I had a master's. I thought I'd be a geologist my whole life. And then we all, our company got sold and the whole company got uh, laid off in, in 1986. And there were probably 10,000 geologists that, that got laid off in those years. So there were no jobs. I lost not just my job, but my profession. And an industrial psychologist came to Buckhorn Petroleum, our company, the offices before we closed them. And he spent an hour with each one of us individually. And my one burning memory of that was he said that all change, even change you, 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 you are seeking, but all change involves loss and all loss must be mourned. And that takes those negative spaces, right? That, that to really feel and go through and process the loss that's involved in any serious change in your life. 
those negative spaces that the moments of quiet really are, are valuable. Yeah. Um, I read this Eckhart Tolle quote yesterday, which talked about how any, it was specifically about artists, but really any kind of creative endeavor can only occur when your soul is silent. Oh, and, that's interesting. Yeah. And a friend of mine told me, I, I'm, fortunately, I can't cite the book, but um, she had read a book that talked about um, George Washington and Martin Luther King and these incredible leaders, um, how they used silence to hear their intuition and that's how they knew how to lead. Mm, that's interesting. That may, it makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, oftentimes you, you know, when I first got elected mayor of Denver, so this was in um, May of, uh, of 2003, and about a couple of weeks after I got elected, a 15-year-old African-American kid was shot in his front hall by a Denver police officer. And it was the uh, fourth shooting, police shooting, that we'd had that year. And the African-American community was rightfully outraged. And there were riots. And I was coming in as the mayor, and I didn't know what, uh, I didn't know what the right response was. And I remember just sitting and thinking and trying to think through it. Uh, and I had a meeting. Uh, the, the, my predecessor, Mayor Webb, was African-American and was introduced me to some of the faith-based leaders. And it's funny, in the quiet before that meeting, when I was just, I wasn't really thinking about anything, right? I was just sitting there. Um, you know, I just felt the enormity of the problem we had, and I didn't really have any ideas. And as the ministers came in, I felt, huh, I wonder if they, if they are, you know, they are part of the solution. And, they, and it turned out that the ministerial alliance, I think it's 35 or 36 black pastors, became my partners. And we created the, you know, the most significant, I mean, it was 10 years before Ferguson, but we created an office of the independent monitor. We created a civilian oversight commission so neighborhoods could control how their neighborhoods were policed. Uh, we hired a diversity officer. Um, uh, we did all kinds of, all kinds of, uh, what were very innovation, innovative things then because the pastors, the, 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 these, uh, faith leaders from the black community, they'd been dealing with this all this time. And they just, you know, no one had ever actually reached out and, and given them a voice, given them a seat at the table. And, you know, to this day, every time I hear about, you know, Aurora, another suburb in, in Metro Denver is having problems now, a lot of these things are waiting to be done still in, you know, in cities around America. They're not expensive. They really do allow the police departments to really work much more closely with the community and neither side is harmed, but it came out of that, that quiet space. Yeah. And it sounds like what you did in that moment was to not try and fix anything, but to just kind of be with it and sit with it. And then as you allowed that, then you knew what to do. Well, you're giving me more credit than I deserve. I, I think I was, there, I didn't, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about it and I had those few minutes before the meeting and, and, and I, I, I think I was overwhelmed. I, it wasn't like I was actively saying, well, I need some quiet time and then something will appear to me. I just was, felt like a wave had washed over me mm. over the previous week. Uh, and, and this was, you know, I was just, I was, I was just there, I was present, but I really wasn't thinking in a funny way. Yeah. Well, now you know it works, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I should be able to turn it on like a switch, but... It mm, doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. So if you could just do one more thing, what would it be? Oh, you know, peace on earth. I mean, <laughs> if you were going to try to do one thing, um, would be to figure out how do you connect the the these elements of of society that are so in conflict. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's ridiculous. People spend their lives working on these things. But in a funny way, 
maybe the one thing that, that I would want to do is find a place where you can do that and have it be an example. In other words, I'm not going to create world peace and I'm not going to be able to solve the conflicts of the world. But there's probably one out there um, that maybe I haven't seen yet, um, but that my experiences and how my mother raised me and being a mayor and a small business person that has prepared me to play that role. And that, you know, I, I feel I've still got another big chunk in my public service. So um, in November, I had the great privilege of um, being in Thailand at the biggest temple, I think, in the world, um, at least physically. It's like seven or eight times the size of the Vatican. Oh, and smokes. Yeah. And there... Their strategy is um, inner peace for world peace. And so they teach meditation, they teach inner peace with this goal of world peace. And when I first heard it, not unlike what you did, you know, I, I sort of, you know, laughed like, oh, how is that possible? Right. Um, but it's only through the opportunity, right, to think about the seemingly impossible, mm. right, that it becomes potentially possible. Well, that, and that, it's funny that I had a, a really difficult couple of years right when I first went to college. And I, I get caught up in depression. I was, it's a whole long story. Um, but in the end, the, the one thing that was most successful in, in, in helping me through that and actually setting me free was, was transcendental meditation. A, a, a friend of, a, a fr the son of one of my mother's best friends, he was maybe three years older than me, uh, convinced me to, to go out and try transcendental meditation, which I still do to this day. And I do believe that it is a wonderful, wonderful template for, for everyone to, you know, to, to not get so wrapped up in, in things that aren't the way you would like them to be. It's just, it, it, it's very powerful. But again, it's very hard to get people to do it. And, and back then, this was in 1972, I think, or 71, 72 when I did, uh, TM learned how to do it. Uh, it was what was the solution. The Beatles were talking about it. Everyone was making this giant push. That we should all meditate. Well, it would take us towards world peace. You know, John Lennon, Yoko Ono, peace in. It's hard to push people in that direction. It's not a natural inclination unless your culture, you know, is somehow preparing you. And even in India, you know, even places where they have shrines and temples and you know, all, a huge emphasis on, on meditation. Most of the, most of the population doesn't meditate that often. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, that's a, a good North star, uh, is to, or at least a good, a good star to have in a constellation, but it, it, that'll be a tough, you know, that's going to take generations. Of course. Yeah. Centuries. Yeah. But somehow there's something beautiful, I think in the, um, maybe even naivete of, of trying to celebrate the big idea. No, you're absolutely right. I agree. And there is, there is some freshness and connection in, in having, figuring out a fresh way to say that in such a way that maybe this next generation of, of let's say the millennials really can, can embrace it and, and move the, push the boulder up the mountain a little further. Great. Thanks so much for talking to me today. Always a treat. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. Conversations about art is part of HiZ.art. This episode was produced by Simon Illa. Our theme music was composed by Eric McDougall. Jordan Weisberg is our curatorial associate. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and review us on whichever platform you listened, as it helps us further our goal of connecting all to art. We'll be back again every other Tuesday with new episodes. Thanks for listening.